Hello and welcome to the i3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography here at the School of Visual Arts. I am Julie Graham. Our guest tonight is Mary Engel. Mary is an artist in her own right and she works with the archives of both of her parents. Ruth Orkin and Maurice Engel were groundbreaking photographers and filmmakers. They were members of the New York Photo League, which I would encourage the students to look up if they're not familiar with them. And on that, I present Mary Engel. Thank you, Julie. Julie and I uh, go a little bit way back, and she became the vice president of my organization, the American Photography Archives Group, APAG, about uh, 15 years ago in 2008, is that right? <laughs> Something like that, which I'll tell you more about later. Um, this topic is really um, you know, close to me. Um, I've been handling my mom's work, as you can see. Um, well, she passed away in 1985, um, and I was given her estate. I was um, working full time, but um, it's just the way it worked out. And as I say later, it's a wonderful legacy, but a huge responsibility. But I chose to do it, and I wanted to do it. Um, I worked and tried to rep other people at different times, but um, it's what I wanted to do. I embraced it, um, and I sort of went down different paths to get to where I am now. But um, in any event, I want to just share like some highlights of her work, my father's work. Hopefully you've heard of Morris Engel. They're most known together doing a film called Little Fugitive that's um, fairly important in the independent film world. I'm going to talk about APAG, which is this archive group that we've been having a lot of fun with. Um, and then I'm going to um, just show you some new books and tell you what's going on with Ruth's work. So this is a self-portrait before selfies, obviously. Um, you know, she was, it was late 40s, um, you know, and uh, she had this short, short hair. Um, so let's see if we can do this. Um, there's, she's got a lot of quotes. She left a lot in the archive. Um, we've been reading it. I'll tell you later what we're working on that's um, really um, interesting um, and why we've been reading the diaries. Um, but obviously this was, I'm sorry, it's a little blurred, but it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, she had a lot of things she wanted to say, and this is, this is one of them um, from the Photographiska show. Um, and Jeanette Beckman, who took this beautiful photo, or not beautiful photo, but she's a wonderful photographer, sorry, <laughs> who's here, of me. She came to my archive and she said, what is this place? Um, she was visiting, I'm right by Union Square, and she came up and she said, oh, I have to come back and do a portrait, and I love this photo, and um, Jeanette's a dear friend um, through Julie. Um, Jeanette's a wonderful photographer, you should check her out. So. Um, the archive is, is crazy, if anybody's been there. Andy French is, was my mom's assistant a long, long time ago, who's in the same building, so Andy knows everything. Sarah happened to go to nursery school with me. I'll just go through the, the group. But anyway, the, wh what was funny is somebody came over to visit me the other day, and they said it's like walking into a brain, like the brain of somebody. And then somebody else who had come over to the archive said, you know, I could have stayed all night just looking at everything. That's all, that's all he meant, but um, it meant a lot. Um, so we're having a really incredible resurgence right now, believe it or not. You may have known her name forever, you may know American Girl, but we, she had very little exposure in Europe. And all of a sudden, there's a lot going on since her, since her um, centennial in 2021. This show, um, I put this first because this opened tonight in Budapest. Um, I'm not there, but uh, I'm sharing it with you. The curator sent me. This was the most interesting photo because I love the doorway, obviously. And it's, um, the show is a little more traditional than some of the other shows I'm going to show you, just a couple installation photos from. But um, it's just incredible to have this traveling show. It's been in, this is the fourth location. Um, it was in Bassano, outside of Venice. It was in San Sebastian that I did go to last year in Spain. It was in Torino this year, earlier this year. Now it's in Budapest, and it's also going to Portugal and maybe a couple other places. So I'm really, really thrilled to have this exposure in Europe. This is actually a super exciting because this just opened two weeks ago at the Cartier-Bresson Foundation in Paris, um, which is obviously impressive for people in the photo industry. And if you're not in the photo industry, hopefully you'll learn who Cartier-Bresson was. <laughs> um, and Clement is amazing. He was the curator and he was, um, he's French. He was the head of the um, San Francisco um, Museum, the modern San Francisco Museum of Modern, modern art, something like that, for two years. And then he went to, he was that chief curator at MoMA for two years. 
And he took an interest. And all you need, I tell people constantly, you just need a curator to take an interest. Um, he took an interest in this bike trip. Um, you can't really, it's not illustrated here, but there's a new book which I can share with you later. Um, and this was a really special thing when she was, I'm going to show you more pictures later, but um, to have this up there um, is amazing and i um, really thrilled that uh, he chose to do it. This is also the, the traveling show that was in Torino. Sometimes they're more creative than others when they do these um, installations. This is amazing. Large blow up of Man and Rain. This was Fotografiska. A couple of people, hopefully you saw that here. Um, the new museum on 22nd. I was so thrilled with this one room. Um, I don't micromanage things anymore. I don't have the time or the energy. So the curator is amazing, Maria Sproul. She just had a baby. Um, but she would come over once a week for like eight weeks and looked at everything. And then when I, I got to the opening, um, you know, at a quarter to six, and I said, this room is enough because this photo of, of my mom and the cameras, and then there's more stuff in that room. You know, it's just exciting to let people do what they know how to do. So I was thrilled with that. That was up for three months. OK, so this is me. Um, so a little bit about me, not too much, don't worry. Um, but I was my mother's uh, and my brother's favorite subject. She had 500 watt floodlights in every room, so she wouldn't miss anything, and the light was right. But I remind people that there was never anything that was I was, um, I feel, bad about or that I was, you know, um, that I didn't like. Um, and, I, and I'll say this publicly, maybe I shouldn't, but thank God, you know, that it's not, I'm not Sally Mann's child because I find that really difficult to, to take and because there's no photo of, of me that my mother shot that I didn't like. If there's anything that's, you know, a little bit suggestive, sometimes I just rip it up and that's my choice. But um, anyway, so I was in front of the camera for her. Um, this was me and my dad shaving, which people seem to respond to. It's an unusual photo. Um, this is, she always had a camera. Andy knows this. And, uh, but again, it wasn't, um, she was, everything was about candid. It wasn't, um, wasn't in your face. It wasn't um, obtrusive. Um, this is me. This is at Fire Island. And um, I had this curly hair, which I still have a little of, um, but it's not blonde. I look like Shirley Temple. I did a lot of commercials, and um, it was in front of the camera, which I'm trying to emphasize. Um, this, I didn't get this photo I wanted of Bob Hope, where I'm under his arm. I couldn't find it, as my friend wanted me to find. But um, I was always there. I was always there. Everything we did in our family was always photo-related, film-related. Um, you know, I was a willing assistant. I was a willing subject. Um, this was in Central Park, so this was easy. I did commercials. This is a commercial when I was a kid. Philadelphia. Um, I'm going to say, so I was in front of the camera, and then what I ended up doing, um, my last full-time job was I was an agent trainee at the William Morris agent, Agency, which was incredible, and that's what I really liked and I really wanted, thought I wanted to do it. Um, and I um, did this film about her for our retrospective at ICP in 1995, um, and it got into the Sundance Film Festival. And I went out to Sundance as an agent trainee and as a filmmaker. And then after that, I came back and I said, well, do I want to represent all these crazy people at the agency? Or do I want to just represent my parents? And so in 96, I quit it. I quit William Morris, and I just uh, decided to represent them instead of uh, being an agent. So let's go to Ruth. So this is Ruth's. Um, Monumental bike trip. This is the subject of the show at the Cartier-Bresson Foundation. So bear in mind, she was 17. It was 1939. She went alone. Why my grandparents let her go, we'll never know, but, <laughs> but they did. This was, a, this was a test trip up to uh, San Francisco. And she designed, if you'll see this, I'll show it to you later, this, this image of a bike. Um, and she won $25. And so this was a test trip. And then what she did is she ended up taking um, trains or taking a car to Chicago, but then, um, then uh, biked over 2,000 miles. Um, this is a, and then took photographs all along the way and also made little, um, took, the, took the proof sheets and made them into a scrapbook, which I'll show you. This was the camera she used, Pilot 6. 
she, um, you know, it was pretty creative because when you look at these and think she was 17 and she hadn't really had um, any formal um, photography, it was just really, um, as she said, she went to the library and sort of studied all the annuals and what, you know, people should do. Um, this was uh, Times Square. This was, the, this was a sample of the scrap of page that she made. So these are all her contact sheets, the contact um, proofs, and then all of the white writing is her writing. She loved captions. So what they actually took, all of the original scrapbook pages, they're actually up in Paris, and they're in a display that's glass so that you can look on both sides and see, because she, she put them on one piece of paper, and there's on, they're on both sides. So it's, um, it's exciting. I'm really glad that, that Clement the, did it. So this is just um, some of the things that she lived by that I just wanted to share with, with people. Um, she had a lot of perseverance. She definitely said study your market and always, you know, she did, had a lot of odd jobs when she was younger. She um, took her little cousin along and knocked on doors on Central Park West to take baby pictures. Um, and she, uh, she, she did that. She was a nightclub photographer. Um, and, you know, basically just have a passion and know why you're shooting what you're shooting. And, um, you know, she would love the, um, the phones these days because you could just shoot anything you wanted. Um, so she lived in, she was born in Boston but grew up in LA and she loved movies. Um, she got a job as a messenger girl, the first messenger girl at MGM. So this is one, this, what she did was go back five years later and do this picture story based on her own experiences and that's V. Carson, the woman on the right that she focused on. Um, these are just a couple pictures from that. And then the, the, the big thing that happened is she wanted to be a cinematographer. So do you think that they let women into the union in 1943? Uh, no. So that really, um, you know, that really um, was, was a frustrating, disturbing thing for her. And um, it said, there was a sign that said, if you join the WAX, they'll teach you how to make movies. So she joined the, the Women's Auxiliary um, Corps and was in, the, was in the Army for six months and then got an honorary discharge. But they didn't teach her how to make movies. She never, ever um, really learned how to, um, she never, not that she didn't learn, she never was able to really shoot film, except when she was very young. She, she shot a little bit of, of 16, but um, it was always a, an issue. Um, so she came to New York. Um, she was very uh, pioneering, adventurous. Um, this is um, in Penn Station. Uh, she, you know, persevered and did her developing in her kitchen. Uh, she lived in three places in the city. She lived first on Horatio Street, 88 Horatio Street for five years then at 88th Street on the west side, and then at um, Central Park West, where she took all the photos from the window. Um, this was her first business card. She put an ad in, I think, The Voice to, to get work. So um, this, was a, a, this was a big deal to buy her first um, camera. You know, that was, that was a lot of money, and she didn't, she didn't have one for a long time, but this was a big deal when she finally bought it. And then this is one of her, I'd say her signature images, comic book readers. She always talked about shooting, you know, what you know and what's in your neighborhood. And this was obviously, these were kids in her West Village neighborhood. And uh, it's become sort of one of her signature images that people like. Um, uh, yeah, you know, so, uh, sometimes she just <laughs> Got the, got, it was the right moment. You know, it's, it's, knowing, it's knowing what you want to shoot, when you want to shoot it, and then getting the right expression, which she did here, obviously. And then something else she always talked about is she would let her finger freeze before she would click the shutter. Um, she, you know, just knew exactly what she wanted. And there's roles where, you know, there's sort of sometimes six to ten images that are strong images, which is unusual, you know. Um, her ratio was, was pretty high. Um, yeah, this is Gansevoort Pier. He was jumping into the Hudson River. Um, there's more of these. Of, he's doing different things, but this was uh, 1948, and this is what the kids, what kids did at that point. This is also one of her sort of sig signature images. This is VE Day in Times Square, 1945. Just says, says a lot. I'm sorry. Yeah. How's that better? 
So Leonard Bernstein, um, she loved music. She said mu music, film, photography, and travel were her four interests, and everything she did revolved around those four. She wanted to go, this was Lewiston Stadium, which is where the Philharmonic played in, um, in, in the city, but she also wanted to go up to Tanglewood, and she asked them if they, would, if they wanted a photographer, and they said, no, we don't need anybody. So she went up there anyway and brought her cello to masquerade as a student. <laughs> And um, they ended up needing her, and they sent all the press to her. Um, and then what's amazing is this time in Bernstein's life, um, it's a sort of five-year period approximately, she shot him so much that anything that's done now from this time period, they come, you know, they come to me to use. Um, and we just saw the new film, Maestro, um, that's pretty um, incredible that, that Bradley Cooper did. And they're using um, one photo for, for marketing and stuff. Um, it's Marian Anderson. This is a, there's a big one of this in the um, African American Museum in uh, DC. And then this is Tanglewood. So Copeland, Bernstein, and Kusevitsky. There's tons of this. Like I'm just showing you a couple highlights of each thing, but the Bernstein and Tanglewood and Lucent Stadium, that's extensive. She did all the musicians that were there. Um, actually, um, what was amazing is that at her memorial, uh, Bernstein came and spoke, and, Len and Isaac Stern played the violin. So um, it paid off to have, uh, to have done that and become friends with people. And Bernstein was working on a book with us, looking at all of these photographs and talking about, um, talking about the images. We're still, we're still in the process of maybe, maybe doing that. Here, here is one of the people who seem to like this one. Of, uh, he's in the green room. That's his sister Shirley behind him. Carnegie Hall. Um, again, this is, an, this is a, and the, all the music stuff was not on assignment, so I like to always reinforce the fact that it's, you don't have to have an assignment to, to do work. You can just do whatever you, it was your passion and what's unique to you and make sure you're doing something that everybody else isn't doing. Um, she always said people waiting is a great, um, great place to shoot, and the light was great because the old Penn Station had the glass, the, the roof. So again, this was um, this is one of her images. Uh, this is another one. Three boys. This we call David, like the statue in in Italy. Um, parade, same thing. She just you know she just shot whatever she was in, whatever she was interested in, and that's how um, that's how a lot of this happened. Um, and uh, the other thing is what's interesting is I'm finding a lot of images that I've never seen before because they're just sitting in the archive. And because of Instagram, everybody's like poo poo social media and Instagram, but because of Instagram, it's given me a challenge to be, become a curator, pretend to be a curator, and go through all the negs and find things that nobody, we've never seen before. And so this image I had never seen. Um, and it's, it's just amazing what, what it does because then you have an immediate place to put it up, to put work up. This is another one. I think this is in the um, Museum of City of New York. Um, the other thing I'm doing is um, I'm trying to donate and sell the work all over to all museums all over the country and all over the world because <laughs> I don't want it at all in one place. Um, and I don't think she would have wanted it. You know, there's some great places to put, to put archives, but um, one of them is in Arizona, and frankly, quite frankly, I don't want it in the basement of Center of Creative Photography, even though that's one of the best places. Um, so it's my goal to just donate, sell. Um, Sean Corcoran is a great curator at the Museum of the City of New York, and he has cold storage. So I also gave him a bunch of all the color work because that was turning. Um, the color was turning, and he's put it in cold storage. Um, this is Israel. She went over to Israel on a, a press junket with the Israeli Philharmonic and ended up living in a, um, on a kibbutz for two and a half months and did a whole picture story on this little girl called Tirza, which she, um, she loved the communal living of a kibbutz. Did a whole series of, of this little girl of Tirza looking in the mirror with the boy looking at her. This is called Jewish Refugees. It's in, it's from an, uh, it's in an airplane in Tel Aviv. So then we go to uh, Florence. Um, she had only went to Europe once in her life, this time in 1951. And um, she 
wanted to stay there, so she was trying to raise money to do something called a stopper. And this is the woman who's in American Girl in Italy, and she met her, her nickname is Jinx. She met her in the hotel, and she said, let's go out and redo what's been happening to us as women traveling alone. Um, so they did, and uh, this is one of the photos. There's a whole group, a whole series of photos. This is another one. And then this is um, the classic one. I hope everybody's seen it. If you've not seen it, you're now familiar with it. Um, and she used to use it as her business card, which is why it just happens to have all the information on it. Um, but the, the story, I mean, I could go on or I can take questions later. Um, you know, it was, not, um, it was not completely staged by any means. You know, they were out doing, walking around and this, sort, this pretty much happened. And then my mother said to her to go back and do it again. So we can talk more about that if anybody wants to talk more about that. This was the, this was the um, article that it was in, When You Travel Alone. It was supposed to be called Don't Be Afraid to Travel Alone, but this is what Cosmopolitan called it in 1952. But, um, and it's, it's all the, the other pictures from the series. And then, you know, the whole thing is that she never shot film, but she always shot her stills as a filmmaker. So this is an example of um, doing something that's like a, a you know, a film. Um, and it's the only series that Steichen put in The Family of Man. So this is called The Card Players. And you tell me if it's like a little film. Um, so, and then we have success. And there's another series called Jimmy the Card Player, Jimmy, sorry, the Storyteller, that's her brother. And there's other series that she did that are, that are reminiscent of just always being cinematic in nature. Um, so again, this was um, an assignment, shoot Marlon Brando. She said he flirted with her the whole time, <laughs> wanted to know where her skirt was from. She had just come back from Italy. This was during Ju Julius Caesar. Einstein was an assignment, Princeton. It's one of the, there's not a lot of him laughing, so this is fairly unique um, of him laughing. And she said he was very patient because she was shooting him like 20, I, I think it was 50 men had given like $10,000 each and she had to shoot each man, you know, shaking his hand, but she only had one camera with a roll of 36, so he had to wait patiently while she reloaded. Um, and this was something that wasn't on assignment. Um, hopefully the photo students, if anybody knows, this is Robert Kappa. Robert Kappa is why Cornell Kappa started ICP. He was killed in, in the war, um, but my mother knew him um, and ran into him in Paris. And then also this is another story, this is Lauren Bacall. She had an assignment to shoot Humphrey Bogart, who was Bacall's um, husband, but Bogart said, you want to come up and meet my wife, sorry. And uh, so she did and took a bunch of very glamorous photos of Bacall. This is I Love Lucy, which I didn't even know I had. I mean, this is the other thing. Um, you know, I'm an archivist, but I'm not a historian, and I'm also her daughter. So you've got this, you're, you're given this huge archive, and you have to sort of figure out what you have and what to make of it. So this is great. I loved Lucy. I loved I Love Lucy. Um, this is Desi Arnaz. I love the Desi Lou jackets. Um, there's, there's a whole couple rolls of these. Um, and then here's Lucille Ball, Lucy, uh, with Desi being made up behind her. Um, again, this is, um, she always shot out of her window. This is 88th Street. This is called Three White Stoops. It's one of her signature photos at this point. This is Man in Rain. Hopefully some of you have seen some of these or you're familiar, so, um, but if not, hopefully you're, you're enjoying just learning about um, different aspects of her work. And there's, I'll tell you about the websites and stuff, but yeah, here's, that's pretty clear. Um, my, her mother, my grandmother was in the silent movies and they used to go to movies in, in LA all the time. And my mother even kept a, a diary of all the movies that she saw with, um, uh oh, with, um, oh, it's, it's back with a um, with a star system of which which image which um, movie she liked and all that kind of stuff okay again this is another series um, 
that I sort of discovered, and uh, Fotografiska did a huge, um, huge mural size, um, wall size of the last one of these. This is three. Again, this is sort of cinematic in nature. They did this one real big. Uh, she did early color. This was one of the first 35 millimeter um, color photos on a, on a magazine. Am I saying that right, Andy? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sometimes Andy knows more than me. Um, anyway, this was also some early, early New York color. Um, it's just really fun to find, find stuff and see what people react to. This, this I had never seen before, and the um, curator from Fotografiska Maria just sort of was looking through slides. And then when I went to the show, she made this as big as this whole wall. So it was really fun. You know, it's just like finding a new photo after all these years. Um, so this is um, the view from our window in Central Park, where I grew up, 66 in Central Park West. This is the Tavern on the Green with the lights. This is the start of the first New York City Marathon. And um, if you look closely, you can spot me, but you'd have to. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was 1970, and it was the, I think, 121 r runners. But I'm, we don't have a pointer, but I'm all the way. Almost towards the top, there's a woman in a white hat. And then next to that is a man, and then I'm holding up uh, an umbrella. Um, but it was a lot of fun. The races were amazing. Um, this is the way um, the Philharmonic used to look in Sheep Meadow before they re it and before they moved it up to the Great Lawn. Now they can't use the Great Lawn at all because the um, Global Citizens concert ruined the lawn till April, unfortunately, or, uh, which is unusual. They don't usually let that happen. But this was always exciting to uh, watch the throngs from the window. We were on the 15th floor. There's um, thousands of photos from the window. And there's two books, which I'll show you in a minute. Yeah, so let's not forget my father. We're doing OK on time? OK. Um, they were married. People don't always know this, but they, they, they were. Um, he, his mentor was Paul Strand, Aaron Siskin. He worked for a um, newspaper called PM, which was one of the first newspapers to give photographers credit. This is Babe Ruth and uh, Mayor LaGuardia. Sorry, the quality is not sharp, but it is what it is. This is like his signature photo. It's called Harlem Merchant. He did a project called the Harlem Document. Um, as part of the photo league, and this was this was one of those photos that, um, you know, to me when I look at photos and I, I look at a lot of feeds and I look not as much as Julie, but I look at a lot, you know, and when you want to keep looking at a photo, to me that's just something I use as a general rule of thumb. It means a lot. So and it, yes, it's my father's photo, but still, to me there's just so much to look at and there's so much going on. And let me also preface it especially my mother. It's not like every photo and or my father that they took was great, but there's just a lot of good ones. So um, it's fun. This is another series he did. This is all my father right now. This is the Shoeshine Boy. This is Coney Island. He shot what he knew. He grew up there. Um, I think that one's at the Jewish Museum right now, actually, the Coney Island Embrace. This is comic book reader. And then he enlisted in the Navy, and his commander was uh, Edward Steichen. Coincident, just just happened to be. Uh, it was a couple from the Navy. He landed on a, on D-Day, but on um, not on uh, Omaha. He landed on Utah, so he lived to tell about it. Utah Beach. This is another one. Um, he was really proud of of all of this. And he shot. This was something he shot. This was a passion project for him. Just phone booths. And then this is um, also just a, um, he did a lot of street fairs. And this is, you know, just a fun picture. And then, um, then it became more fun because this huge rapper printed it, ASAP Ferg. So it got 47,000 likes in two days. And that's the power of social media. Um, and my, I have a son who, who loved this connection with his grandfather and, and ASAP Ferg. And then I ended up meeting ASAP. And, um, it's just, you know, people are, some people are scared of social media and they, you know, they're not sure what to do with it. But um, as Julie and I always discuss, we, we embrace it. You know, we're, um, I'm, not, I'm not that concerned about it. I'd rather people see the photos than have them just, just sit and sit in the archive. 
So the photo league was important. I have very little about this, but if you don't know about it, you should know about it. It was um, a group of photographers who wanted to make socially responsible photos. Um, it started in 1938, ran to 1951 until the government shot it down and accused it of being communist. Uh, there was a spy who turned them all in, Angela Calamaris. Uh, but they had a lot of successful, um, they had this photo notes, they had contests, they had exhibitions, they had projects. Um, yeah, it was, sorry. I, yeah, so this is just a, a photo. We found some photos later of um, some of the shows. I don't know who these people are, but this is just an example of the shows that they had. Um, so has anybody seen Little Fugitive? Couple of people, okay. So Little Fugitive is this film that my um, dad wanted to make uh, really, really badly and people turned him down and then he finally got somebody to help him and then um, started shooting um, Coney Island and it became, it's become sort of an um, important independent film. One of the reasons is, um, and then my mother became involved later because she edited it. Um, the editor that my father had chosen couldn't do it and my, he was living with my mother and asked her to do it. And it's partly because of this. It was a handheld 35 millimeter camera that my father made with another man. And at that time it was very um, unusual. It's currently also, I'm sorry for all the museum references, but I'm so pleased and thrilled about all of it. This is currently also at the Museum of the City of New York. If you haven't seen it, there's a show called This is New York. So there's a little section on Little Fugitive and the camera's the first time the camera's been on display. Um, but Godard wanted to borrow it, the, the French filmmaker, and uh, Truffaut said, Truff, Francois Truffaut said it helped start the French New Wave, the film. Um, and I just had a lovely meeting. I'm now, I'm pals, I'm gonna say pals because I think she would admit that with um, Luna, who is Truffaut's granddaughter. Because of this unusual connection, we have this affinity for one another. Um, and it's really fun. And then, um, so the Academy Awards, I put this here just to remind myself and to remind you, um, just tell you that, um, I'm sorry, what is that? Yeah, it was held in New York. Um, so for us, we were, we were Jewish culturally, but the Academy Awards was our most important holiday in, in, in our family. Um, absolutely, and that's my parents in the front row right there. It was one, as I try, was trying to say, it's one of the only times it was held in New York. And that's Audrey Hepburn, who was getting up to win her Best Actress for Roman Holiday, which was nominated the same year. But so the film Little Fugitive was nominated for an Academy Award, and it won the, won the Golden Silver Lion, well, the Silver Lion at Venice, because they didn't give out, a, um, they didn't give out this, the Golden Lion that year. So all the people who were supposed to get got a Silver Lion anyway. Um, and then they had a they had us they had um, they showed the film back as a 60th anniversary at Venice. So this is the um, the DVD version. So here's APAG. Um, in 2000, uh, I started. I had a little dinner with five people, and um, because people were sent to me to talk about archives, um, I'm not even touched the. I have barely touched the archive. Um, um, issue yet, but a little bit. But anyway, so um, we had five people for a dinner. Um, then we went to 12, we went to 17, 27, 47. We're now close to 300. Um, and we have Zoom meetings every two to three weeks. Um, we used to meet in person at ICP three times a year. This is an annual seminar that we did, which we were really proud of um, at ICP. This was um, our third or fourth one, we did four of them, which was a weekend of all we did was talk about archives and photography and, and you know, it's like a support group for anybody handling a privately held photo archive. These are a couple of the people, Peter's um, Ali, uh, the Sam Shaw family has Marilyn, um, Julie has beautiful Audrey Hepburn, we have Bob Gruen, who has the John Lennon photo. We have Jeanette Beckman, who has all of her photos. We have Ansel Adams. We have Imogene Cunningham, uh, Gordon Parks. We have a lot of uh, well-known. And then, you know, everybody's not well-known, but we have a lot. Norm is here, right? Who else is from? Jill? Yeah, we have a couple members. Yeah. Um, sorry. So if I, um, but it's really thrilling to have everybody. Um, and we just, it's just a support group for people handling archives. We do, we used to do field trips. Hopefully we'll redo them. 
This is Sean, who I've been talking about from the Museum of the City of New York, who showed us the archive. Uh, for us, it's like really exciting to see how people's archives are kept because we want to improve what we, how we do our, at least that's my, that's my feel, and we want to improve what we're doing. We did, we went up to Gordon Parks, which is great. If you're up in Pleasantville, you should stop in there. Um, Avedon was incredible. Um, it's it's uh, an intimidating place. James is lovely, and I think we were going to bring 15 people, and I said, I have 35 who want to come. He said, bring them all. This is the negative room at Avedon, and there's like two people, only um, there's a camera, um, and there's always two people that have to go in at, at every time when they're, when they're there on their own. But he was gracious enough to show us what was there. We went to New York Times Morgue, which was amazing. Just all these amazing archives all over the city that you don't think of, but they're there. So this is just a sample of our Zooms. Um, we lost um, two, two people. Um, one was uh, Marvin, actually, who happens to be um, circled there in the yellow. Um, Marvin Newman was 96. He passed away um, last month, as well as an, another honorary friend, Henri Doma. I see next to Norm, who's here. Um, but Norm is, is, is fine. And uh, anyway, we, we, and we just love having um, our meetings. Um, this was an interesting, um, David Hume Kennerly was the Obama, was one, not, not Obama, but um, he shot nine presidents and his archivist, Randa, was a, was a member and so David came on and started telling us about his photos and it was just amazing. I think he shot nine presidents, if I'm not mistaken. And we do have Pete Souza as a new member who shot, um, who did shoot Obama. Um, so this is um, a book that I, started because there wasn't anywhere to turn when I first, um, when I first uh, started out. So I compiled this. It's chapters of all different experts and we're redoing, we're redoing this. Hopefully it'll be done by the end of the year. It's about six years old. This is just a little uh, tidbit. This is my mom and uh, the woman in the photo. Her real name is, is Nynalee Craig, um, but it's her nickname was Jinx. So we call her Jinx, we call the photo Jinx. Everything is Jinx, 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 Jinx. Um, she passed away in, uh, I guess, four years ago. They actually finally recreated, you know, we weren't, we were trying to recreate it, trying to recreate it. They sort of did this in a small way up in Toronto. So, so it was fine. We were gonna fly to, we were gonna fly to Italy. We were gonna get Alitalia. We were gonna do it big, but it, didn't work. Um, this is at the gallery in Toronto at Stephen Bulger. Um, this is how my mom's um, office used to be. I always used to help her with nags, help her with filing, you know, pr a little bit of press, whatever. It was, it was in the house. It was, it was in our, you know, it was, it was uh, part of our, our life, basically, her, her studio, her work. And this is what my archive and her and my father's archive somewhat looks like now. Um, it's a lot, it's a lot there. Um, I just, just added this just to show you backs of prints. If anybody collects prints, the auctions are this week, Phillips is tomorrow. Um, just to have a sense of every single photographer that I'm aware of, people do things differently. Um, if you ever buy prints, um, sign your prints, you know, you can say, how should I do it? But everybody does it differently. Um, so she never knew that things would be, have this kind of value. Um, so this one is interesting because she has the 88th Street stamp, but she crossed that out and she put the Central Park West stamp. The Central Park West stamp only has two numbers for the zip code, so that means it's an earlier zip code. She happened to sign it, she happened to title it, but that's unusual. Um, she didn't do that all the time. This is also how she kept her negs. Um, she would attach the contact sheet to the neg um, sleeve so she could always find the negs, which is super helpful. So it's just to show you the negs, and um, almost everything she shot was 35, except actually the bike trip is um, two and a quarter. And I actually let the curator take the actual negatives, which I never ever do, <laughs> but in some circumstances you just go with it. Uh, this is just to show her signature. This is um, Judy Collins, who she met when she was up at um, Yaddo in Saratoga and um, became friends with. Uh, this is how I sign prints now. I make posthumous prints. This is an embossed signature. 
This is just to show you. These were 10 books that she wanted done, and um, I think she'd be really happy now because we've had four in the last uh, two years. Um, these are ones that were done a while ago. Those are the two window books. And this one, actually, that with um, Richie outside was 2014. Photojournal is her main book from 1981. So basically, we didn't have a book for 40 years. And now, all of a sudden, we have four. So somebody brought this one tonight, and they asked me to sign this. I'm really thrilled with this. We did it all by Zoom because it was during COVID, and I never met the, um, the, the editor from Germany. And I finally met her this year. Um, really pleased with this one. And then we have this one. I gave one out. I don't know if there's, OK, thanks. Um, so that's the, there's um, two. These are not, I, it's not available in the States yet, but they will be. Um, and then this is the Spike Trip book that's really <laughs> thrilling. So you see this design. She made this design, and she won this contest. And there's a dress of it that's hanging in the, at the exhibit in Paris. Um, so I was told not to mention my son, but, <laughs> but just, like, uh, just like I'm in everything, I had to include him. Um, so he, he actually, I didn't go. He went to the Venice Film Festival for the, for the anniversary of, of, um, of um, Little Fugitive. I was in London. And then this was um, the opening. Um, I just love the three generations of us, you know, a lot of curly hair there. Um, this, I do a lot of posting, if anybody. Um, follows me or wants to. This is my personal one. And then there's also Ruth's, um, which is Ruth Orkin, this one, at Ruth Orkin Photo. And what again, what I've been doing is just putting up a lot of unknown images. I'm scanning. I just go to the envelopes, and I just find anything. And sometimes I, I scan what she marked, and sometimes it's, it's what I want. So it's not always exactly following her. One of the things, I mean, there's so much more I could say. I know I'm missing everything on my list. But one of the things I always tell people about managing an archive, managing your own work, there's an, I mean, there, is, there are rules, but on the other hand, there's no rule. It's really about what you want to do. And with an archive, when I've inherited something like I have or anybody, um, you know, you have to, you want to honor the photographer. But on the other hand, it's your choice is to do whatever you want to do to make the work be seen. And that's the whole goal is just to let her work be seen. So that top row of. I think they're sort of drunks on the sidewalk I had never seen before. Um, and the dog show, this woman with the dog, I had not really seen. This is something I'm working with, with my friend here, who's here, um, Stephen. And it's a, it's a limited series about her life. Um, like each, each episode is going to be like MGM, Tanglewood, Europe, Little Fugitive, my parents. And we're sort of. Um, we're sort of uh, pitching this right now to different people. So this is sort of exciting. There, there's, always, there's been interest in this, but anybody who's involved with film and docs know it's a, it's a long road, but, um, but it's, it's fun. Um, this is almost the end. So I did this uh, little um, thing for, I did this little uh, logo for her centennial. I have t-shirts. And these are the, the websites. And then um, these are the Instagram handles. And uh, this is also an unseen one of Jinx and Justin in the car. But she's waving goodbye. So I thought it was appropriate. So there you go. That's it in a nutshell. How old were you when you kind of realized how prolific your mom was and how much work she actually did. Was it when you were going through the archive later or were you young and realized how much work that she had actually done and had, had been doing? That's a good question, Matthew. <laughs> um, she had her first show sort of that I was aware of in, like in 1974, you know, and I was sort of an, a, a young teenager. So the minute she started having books and shows, it became more apparent that, you know, she was not just shooting me in, in our house, you know, and, or our friends, that there was more going on. But did I really realize the scope of it at that point? Not completely, um, but it was um, later, later on, you know, where it became even more apparent, but, but fairly, fairly young, you know, if that answers the question. Uh, 
Um, I just, this is Okay, I just have a, one sort of question. You mentioned where that interesting moving camera, I'm, I'm sorry, made out of 35 mil camera into a moving um, camera. I can't think of the word. It's a movie camera. It's a movie right. camera. Okay. Yeah. And Let's uh, call it that. you mentioned that it was on display somewhere, but I didn't hear yeah, it. Yeah, at, at the Museum of the City of New York. They have a, a at the show. the city of New York. Okay. Yeah, it's a, I hope that people have gone there. It's an amazing museum that a lot of people don't go to. It's a little, it's on 103rd and 5th, but it's, it's really beautiful. It's a little gem, and they have a great show right now. I think this show is up for like a whole nother year, but there's a little corner of, of Little Fugitive, and the, the, the camera is there, so I'm, I'm thrilled with that. And they have some clips of Little Fugitive as well. It's the 100th, I just heard you on NPR. It's the 100th. Anniversary, right. Yeah. No, it's ca it's a, it's a beautiful. I mean, the show I think is still up. Is I've seen it a couple times. They have a they have a movie. They have a room that's like an immersion room of films, where they have twenty minutes of all the New York films that are kind of sort of coming at you. They have costumes. They have drawings. They um, paint paintings. Um, it's a really nice show. So. Uh, hi, Mary. Hey, Jeanette. <laughs> I was just wondering if your mom, because there's a lot of street photography, which I personally love, and street photography is so huge now. I was just wondering if your mom used to just pick up a camera and go, right, I'm going to Harlem on a sign to take pictures if she suddenly, you know, like I do. You know, yeah, absolutely. I don't think she went all over the city too much. I mean, definitely in the park. I mean, I'd be with her and she'd go up to somebody and say, I, I wanna, I'm a photographer, can I take your picture? And um, I don't think she did it as much as my dad did because my dad would go to street fairs, he'd go um, all different things. But obviously when she was younger, so I'm talking about what I recall is what I was telling you, but it's pretty clear that she did parades, she did Penn Station, she just, yeah, absolutely. If that answers the question. Yep. Mary, it's so fantastic. The, um, one of the things you mentioned was that this, uh, that uh, your mom had mentioned uh, the books that she would like to have published. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it makes me think just if, I know you do this a lot, giving advice to people who are, uh, who are um, uh, thinking about an archive and setting up an archive, that kind of thing. What kind of questions should people be um, a asking themselves or, or their family members should be asking or people interested in setting up an archive for photographers? What should they be asking the, those photographers before they pass? Well, that's a very good question. I have in my book, I didn't bring the book, but um, we have 10 tips. I have two sets of 10 tips, I mean, of things that, um, you know, photographers should do. I mean, some very, some very obvious ones are you know, tell somebody their wishes, you know, and talk into a microphone about certain stories. Don't try to, you know, think about all the work, think about, you know, 250 images or, or 100 or 500. Um, really focus on the important stuff. Definitely, um, you know, um, throw away stuff while you're alive so it's not left for whoever, whoever it is. Um, there, there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot. That's what we talk about all the time in the group as to what what one can do and what they should do. Um, but um, yeah, I I'm, don't have the list of the 10 right. tips in front of me, but um, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's in the book and actually it's probably online on the website. Anyone else? Last questions, comments? Yep. All right, I'll come back to you in one second. Heading to the back. Throw stuff away. Thank you. Hi, thank you for sharing with us. Um, you mentioned that you like the, their work being in different um, museums and places. So I was wondering if you could share with us the, how you contact these different museums and how you build a relationship with them. Yeah, with a lot of difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, even, even in the position I'm in and even, you know, again, like sometimes people do come to me Clement came to me. I think somebody, you know, connected us. But a lot of times, um, I, I, one of my biggest issues, one of my biggest things that I do is keep track of everybody. 
whether it's all the curators or all the gallerists um, and, and anybody who's doing anything in the photo world. But I, I have a couple um, stories recently with, um, like I donated to the Cleveland Art Museum and I had met that curator a long time ago. Somebody connected me with somebody at the Getty recently. Um, you know, Sean Corcoran at the Museum of the City of New York I've known for a long time. But it takes, museums takes a lot of work it's a lot of effort. Um, even even though I know people, um, they don't always respond. I've been trying to give Paul Strand to the Philadelphia Museum for a long time, because he has a huge collection of Paul Strand. <laughs> and he finally, I'm, I mean, I don't need to mention names, but I mean, he finally called me about something completely unrelated, and I said, "What about those Paul Strand? I want to give you." And it, it's it, it takes a lot of effort. And it's 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 a step easier for me to do it for my mother than for a photographer to do it for themselves. O obviously, that's that's something you have to remember. But marketing and um, you know, getting your work out there is it's essential. Um, and having the basic stuff, websites, doing social media, um, you know, it's it's endless. What what you I mean, my motto is I can never do enough. Um, because I, and if you look at my website, I mean, I do, I do, I have a store, I do all the, in, I do all the social media, I do branding, I do all the licensing, I do all the, the shows and the books, um, primarily without a full-time assistant. So, I hope that sort of answers your question, but be, be, you have to persevere. And also with galleries, what I've been telling people, people used to want to come and show me their work, and what I tell people is to go and tell me where they think their work should be. You know, like my mother would always say, study your market and, you know, do what you need to do and then come back to me and say, well, I think this is right or this is right. But, um, you know, there's so much you can do, especially these days on your own. But it's again, it's much easier for somebody like me than the photographer themselves. But you just have to persevere. That's all I can say. Um, I saw your father was alive through 2015. Five, did, 2005. Oh, 2005, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Um, did he uh, ever retire from art? And also, did how did he interact with the legacy of, of himself and then your mother as okay. well? Okay, so what do you think the answer is to the first question? No. No. No, if anybody <laughs> knows any photographers, they, I'm just, I'm not trying to be, I'm just, they don't retire. I mean, unless you can't deal with your, if you come in firm or you can't, but almost, I mean, the, Marvin Newman was 96, every, their Sante is 93, right? I mean, the people, um, photographers don't retire, so I'm just trying to, to make a point as far as I know. Um, and how did he deal with my mother's success? Was that sort or of? Did he, um, I, I'm sure he helped you in, in um, the archive, in creating the archives, but did he kind of acknowledge his own success or your mother's success, and how did he handle that? Or? It was very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll put it that way, but no, Andy knows the real story. Um, I mean, I helped him a lot at the end of his life because um, he was not as interested in marketing his work, and he was, he, he was much earlier than my mother. His pals were Bernice Abbott and Helen Levitt, um, you know, in, and then all the people in the photo league, you know, like I said, like Paul Strand, he worked, Paul Strand wrote the intro to his show in 1939 at the New School. Um, you know, he, he went earlier than my mother, but he didn't, he wasn't as good as marketing himself and he didn't like to do it. My mother was better at it. Um, so am I answering your question? Um, keep going. So the question is what did he um, finish the question? Uh, I, I think you answered. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I mean, it's so competitive. I mean, there's um, the competitiveness is an issue, and I didn't actually, I didn't even touch a really important issue is the fact that my mom was a woman, which she used for her, which was worked for her and against her. So she would say it's not like she always got, you know, um, uh, she didn't get jobs or something because she was a woman, um, but that certainly did happen, and she also used it in her favor. But when they made the movie, this was the 50s, she did not get the recognition she, she should have gotten it. And, and things are called like Morris Angle's Little Fugitive or even to this day. Um, and some of it is hard to can, can, you know, can do exactly the right thing, but um, it's, it's, it's complicated. But so that's why we're trying to do the, the limited series and sort of tell the story. But um, any, any, um, any um, artistic couple 
um, there's always one that's um, has you know that has more notoriety. Let's say there was a joint show. I'll just share this in in 1999 at Howard Greenberg, and my mom wasn't alive. My dad was alive. It was a joint show. I con convinced him to do it, and. Um, <coughs> What is her name? Oh, Margaret Loke, I'll say this. The New York Times editor decided to say that my mother was a better photographer than my father in the New York Times. So, um, so when I say complicated, that's just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> um, and not, not getting the recognition for, um, for, you know, for the film and then not being able to shoot. That really worked against her as a woman. Um, not that women, I don't, you know, so women weren't let into the cinematographer's union. Um, there's only, I, I don't know the stats right now. There's, I don't know if there's five or eight at one point I was studying exactly. There's the ASC and then there's the cinematographer's union. Ellen Curris, who's one of the, the, in the, in the union, just directed, I, I think it's her first directing job for the new movie Lee that's about Lee Miller, and actually Lee Miller's granddaughter's in our group. I had dinner with her last year. She's amazing. So if you haven't heard about that or read the Vogue cover story about um, Kate Winslet, who, again, you've got Kate Winslet, you've got an incredible story with Lee Miller. If you don't know it, read about it. Um, and you've got a female director, um, and they couldn't get it made. It took them eight years. So anyway, I could go on and on about that. And she, again, she didn't always... Um, I was trying to, I'm going to do a podcast, and this woman who's helping me is a, one of my former agents. <laughs> I mean, I work for her. You know, she keeps talking about how, you know, Ruth was authentic. And, um, you know, we were reading also in the, in the diaries that, like, she wanted to be a housewife, too. Like, she wanted, she wanted to entertain. You know, she didn't, it's not like she, you know, poo-pooed everything. She wanted it all, you know, so just to tell people. Um, you know, you can be successful and have this kind of career and have some of the iconic photos she has, but she still wanted, you know, she wanted to, you know, live the dream in her own way. And uh, she somewhat succeeded, but I think we all struggle with, like, what, what are we trying to achieve and what can, we, what can we do? And one of the reasons I left William Morris is, I think I said it, if I didn't, I, I wanted to have a kid, which I do. He's, I see, you saw him, he's 23. And I didn't want to work at a, I didn't want to be beholden to a job, you know, you know, nine to five job. Um, and my mother was, you know, able to. The one thing also is that she wasn't on staff anywhere, so I own 100% of all the negatives. And that's a huge, huge deal. Whereas my father's stuff on PM, we don't have, we don't have some of his, a lot of his stuff. So. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, of course. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.